Uh, my name is Cameron Hewitt, and I'm going to be telling you a little bit about Eastern Europe today. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, I work here in the office at Rick Steves Europe. Uh, mostly I focus on guidebooks, uh, researching and writing our, our various uh, guidebook titles. I've also worked as a tour guide. I've actually led the tours that we do to Eastern Europe and also to Croatia and Slovenia. Uh, and the thing I'm probably the, the most proud of, the thing I spent a lot of my time on, is I'm the co-author of Rick's guidebooks on Eastern Europe, Budapest, and Croatia and Slovenia. Co-author, what does that mean? Uh, basically, it means that I went over and did all the work to write the book to begin with. And then uh, Rick came along uh, and put his touches on it, and then we put his name on it because it would sell more copies that way. Um, no, I'm teasing. Rick and I have a great collaboration. Um, he really enjoys the fact that I've got so much enthusiasm for this area, and then he comes and checks in every so often. He's going to Poland this year, for example, in the fall, just to check in on things after a few years. Um, now, by co-author, it also means that I'm responsible personally for updating those guidebooks. Um, so I go over every other year, uh, and I personally visit every business that we list in our guidebooks on those destinations. So I go to Budapest, for example, and I go to every single hotel, restaurant, internet cafe, tourist office, museum, train station, uh, I can personally guarantee you that this is the most lovingly up-to-date guidebook that you're going to find on this region. I have a lot of personal contacts with the folks uh, who run a lot of these businesses, and you'll be actually meeting a few of them during the course of the slideshow today. Um, let's go ahead and get started on our trip to Eastern Europe. And I just wanted to give you a taste of some of the things we're going to be seeing together. Um, before we do that, though, I think the first thing we need to do when traveling to this part of Europe is to have a little bit of an attitude adjustment. Um, and that's because I think for a lot of folks, when you think of Eastern Europe, you still think of the Cold War. Uh, and I'm going to really challenge you to pry open those Cold War blinders. Things have changed dramatically. Uh, freedom is deeply entrenched uh, in these parts of Europe. It's been uh, 25 years. Kids who are 30 years old, kids, young adults who are 30 years old who live in these countries have no living memory of communism. Um, so all the Soviet Union, USSR, Cold War stuff, it's an important chapter of their history, but it's a brief chapter, and it's not the defining chapter. Um, so I'm really going to challenge you when you think about Eastern Europe to realize these are very different, diverse, proud countries um, for a lot of the people who live here. That, that communist period that com dominates our thinking was just a little bit of a, a blip in their, in their historical radar. Um, yes, of course, they do have this sort of imposing history embodied by this statue here of, of Lenin uh, standing in a park. And I, I would say, rather than be intimidated or feel confronted by this communist connection, these days in Eastern Europe, this is part of their history that's kind of fun. You can be playful about it. Um, the statues of Lenin are now gathered in kind of theme parks where you can go out and see what it was like a generation and a half ago when these, these statues were actually out in the streets. Uh, the people who live here have forgotten about the communist period, so I hope that you will too, and uh, accept each of these countries for what it is. Again, if you have a, an old, dated Cold War era notion of what Eastern Europe is, it might be rusted factories and this kind of industrial gross smog. These days in much of Eastern Europe, the reality looks a little bit more like this. Beautiful, idyllic countryside. Uh, fascinating cities, dynamic, colorful, vibrant, modern cities. Some of the showpiece cities in all of Europe. Prague, of course, the capital of the Czech Republic. Uh, Krakow is the finest town in Poland. Uh, wonderful cities that you probably never heard of or never put on your mental maps. Gdansk up in the northern coast of Poland is one of my favorite cities in Eastern Europe. Uh, very much undiscovered by American tourists. You've got a lot of very epic stately history embodied, for example, in the Hungarian parliament building there in Budapest. Some of the finest people zones anywhere in Europe, the Charles Bridge in Prague. And some unique experiences, things that you won't experience anywhere else on the continent, such as the delightful thermal baths of Budapest. Natural wonders, Eastern Europe's got that too. Spectacular mountain valleys. Uh, in general, it's just a really rewarding and engaging place to travel. Uh, although, aside from all of its tangible attractions and the things I'll be talking about in the slideshow, one of my favorite things about Eastern Europe, the thing that really keeps me coming back, are the wonderful people that you encounter there. Um, now, I say communism is old news and, and people have gotten beyond all of that, but this is still a different part of Europe. Tourism is not quite as, as, as sort of uh, mainstream and as entrenched as it is in some really touristy Western European towns like, let's say, Salzburg or Venice. One thing I really like about traveling in Eastern Europe is the locals um, are still really um, flattered by the attention from tourists, and it's a really easy place to connect with people. So no matter where you go in Eastern Europe, you'll find that there's somebody who's really excited that you took the opportunity to come and see them. They know that they're kind of the underdogs of Europe. Uh, they're greatly appreciative about that. They're extremely proud about their local culture and very happy to show it off for you. 
again, it's, a, it's one of my favorite places in all of Europe for connecting with the local people. Let's define our terms here, Eastern Europe. The first thing I'm going to tell you is a little bit shocking. This is not Eastern Europe, it's Central Europe. People who live in these countries will insist uh, you'll go to Poland or you'll go to Hungary, you'll show them your Eastern Europe guidebook and say, we're really enjoying our trip in Eastern Europe, and they'll say, well, then why are you in my country? This is Central Europe. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, yes, we call it Eastern Europe here at Rick Steves because we know that's what most Americans think of when they think of these countries. Uh, but for Europeans, especially people in this area, they would point out, technically Europe starts at the Iberian Peninsula on the western tip of this map and ends at the Ural Mountains at the eastern tip of this map. And by golly, there's Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, all right there in the very, very center of Europe. They're actually a little bit west of center. Uh, there's also a kind of a politically loaded aspect to Eastern Europe. We say Eastern Europe meaning formerly communist Europe. And again, these people would like to forget about that and help you realize that there's much more to these places than just that communist period. If you're interested in that, you'll find it. There's interesting sites to see there, uh, but there's much more than that. So when we talk about Eastern Europe or Central Europe, we're mostly referring to these countries. They're kind of the westernmost, most accessible of the former communist countries of the Soviet bloc. We've got the Czech Republic. By the way, that used to be one country, Czechoslovakia, and now it's two separate countries, Czech Republic and Slovakia. Uh, up to the north there, you've got Poland. Down south, you've got Hungary. Uh, that'll be the focus of this talk. You can also include in Eastern Europe, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Montenegro. These are parts of the former Yugoslavia. I'll be covering that in a second talk, um, in fact. Uh, by the way, I wanted to offer a special welcome to the folks who are watching this online as well. Thank you all for being here in person. Uh, but there's also a large audience streaming this or maybe watching it later on our website. And those two talks are available as separate talks also on our website. We're going to launch right into the first of our countries. Again, this, this talk is really focused on the three biggies, Czech Republic, Poland, and Hungary. Well, let's start with the Czech Republic. It's kind of a bowl-shaped country, uh, ringed by mountains on all sides and somewhat flat in the middle. Right there is the capital of Prague in the heart of the Czech Republic. Uh, and then you've got some interesting side trips that I'll talk about that are a little bit outside of the capital. My favorite is Chesky Krumlov. It's down in the southern tip right near the Austrian border. For a lot of people who travel to Eastern Europe, Prague is their first and maybe their only stop, and for very good reason. Uh, there are a few more romantic, more beautiful, more uh, architecturally well-preserved, uh, more interesting, more engaging cities that you're going to find than Prague. It's also very easy to get to. You might notice on this map, again, we think Prague is Eastern Europe. Prague is actually west of Vienna, for example. Um, it's, it really sticks out into what we think of as Western Europe. So it's very easy to reach to tack onto a trip, even if you're not delving deep into the east. Uh, you can just take a, a quick hop there. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what you would see and do in Prague. There's really four towns, historically, that merged to form the city that we today call Prague. Uh, there's the Old Town, which is kind of right in the bend of the Vltava River. Just beyond that, wrapping around it, is the New Town. Across the river, you've got the Castle Quarter up on the hill. And down below the Castle Quarter is the Little Quarter. It's kind of a strange, it's called Mala Strana, which means lesser town or lower town or little quarter. Um, it's, it's translated different ways. It's below the castle. Uh, let's take a quick spin through all four of those four towns of Prague. The nice thing about Prague is it's quite compact. Everything you see here is more or less walkable, although trams and a subway system can help kind of speed up some of the gaps. We're going to begin in the new town. This is really the heart of today's modern, urban, vibrant Prague. Wenceslas Square, it's named for the 9th century Czech Duke of uh, Good King Wenceslas of Christmas Carol fame. Actually, he was a, a very important Czech figure. He was kind of the cultural standard bearer of the Czech people. And Wenceslas Square, the square that's named for him, is probably the least touristy part of central Prague. Uh, Prague, as, as I'll talk about later, is, is pretty crowded. But here on Wenceslas Square, you might actually see more Czechs than you will uh, tourists. Uh, it just buzzes all the time with life and commerce and, and shops and this sort of thing. Um, what I'll say about Prague, Wenceslas Square, applies really to all of Eastern Europe, which is the history here is very recent, and it's very subtle, and it's easy to miss. And for that reason, I highly recommend hooking up with a good local tour guide. Uh, obviously, we've done our best in our guidebooks to take the place of a tour guide, uh, but there's nothing like having a person in the flesh explain to you what you're seeing when you're walking around a town like Prague. This is our very good friend, Hans of Ihan. He's actually the co-author of our Prague and Czech Republic book. He's a native Czech. He grew up in Prague. Um, it's really fun to go walking through the streets of Prague with Hansa, and right there near Wenceslas Square, we go down a little side street, and he points out this plaque. And I just was about to blow right past it, and Hansa said, now wait a minute, take a look at this. This plaque has the date, November 17th, 1989. There's a bunch of open hands on top of it. 
He said, you know, you wouldn't know it from this nondescript plaque, but this was a very important date in Czech history. This was the day, uh, a couple of months, about a month after the Berlin Wall came down, so there was a sense of change in the air. Um, young people especially were fed up with the communist system. It happened to be the day of celebrating the Czech national poet, which is also the Czech National Students' Day, and there was a big celebration, as there always is. After the celebration, a bunch of frustrated students said, you know what, let's go down to Wenceslas Square and have a little bit of a protest. Let's say we want what happened in Berlin to happen here. So these students set off across town, and gradually as they approached Wenceslas Square, they found themselves enclosed in this covered passageway, the shopping arcade. And before they knew it, the riot police, the communist riot police, had completely surrounded them. They were blocking the outside of the, uh, the, the pedestrian uh, promenade. They blocked off each end. The only way for the students to escape was to run out along basically a line of riot cops who were hitting them with batons as they ran through. Pretty terrifying and pretty upsetting. Well, you know what? Word got out about this. The next day, parents and people in the community heard about this and said, this is not how we're going to be treated by our government. Um, so very slowly, the Czech people started to come out to Wenceslas Square and stage demonstrations. And over the course of 10 days, more and more people came out on Wenceslas Square. You couldn't even walk across the square. It was jam-packed, hundreds of thousands of people from all over Czechoslovakia. They held up their keys and jingled them and said to the regime, it is time for you to go. Václav Havel, the beloved philosopher and playwright who'd spent time in prison after being um, sort of a political protester in the 1960s, emerged from hiding and arose as sort of the, the leader of this new rebellion, this new revolution. After 10 days of protests, the communist parliament simply voted itself out of existence. Czechoslovakia was a free country. It was called the Velvet Revolution because not a shot was fired. Wow, does that give you goosebumps, right? Uh, this is amazing, and this is what I love about Eastern Europe. There's a very fine line between current events and history, and it gets blurred here like nowhere else. And as uplifting and amazing as that story is, it's even more amazing when it's told by Hansa, who has a 12-year-old kid hanging out with his sister was one of those young protesters who got trapped in this very place and beat by the riot police and inspired a nation to take back their freedom. That's the essence of Eastern Europe, and that's why connecting with people like Hansa can really make a trip here something special. We're going to head into the Old Town, which is really the showpiece of Prague, right in the center. This is tourist sort of Grand Central, and, and I sure don't blame them. It's just an absolutely delightful a uh, place to hang out and spend time. As you can see, it's gorgeous. As a tour guide leading our Rick Steves tours, I really enjoy the first time that my groups arrive in Prague. Uh, in the evening as the sun is setting, I'm taking them to dinner, and I always make sure that we walk through the Old Town Square. And I just stop for a moment in the center so people can look around and, and gasp at all the beauty. And invariably, someone nudges me excitedly and says to me, this is better than Disneyland. And they're absolutely right. Um, this is the real deal. Uh, it's like a, a sort of a textbook of archi uh, architectural styles. A lot of the big cities of Eastern and Central Europe were devastated in World War II. Prague never was, so it's remarkably well-preserved, uh, and it's a great place. Even if you don't think you're interested in architecture, you can't deny the beauty of this place. Uh, one thing I also enjoy doing in my guidebooks and as a tour guide is introducing people to the local patriots and heroes of each of these countries who we've never learned about in American textbooks because this was part of the Iron Curtain, behind the Iron Curtain, part of the Soviet bloc. Uh, well, each of these countries has its own very proud national symbols. This is Jan Hus. Jan Hus was a Czech a minister, priest, um, and also a university professor. He spoke out against Catholic Church corruption. He spoke out against the practice of indulgences. He did a lot of the same things, uh, for example, that Martin Luther did, except Jan Hus did them 100 years before Martin Luther, and he was uh, burned at the stake uh, as a punishment. Um, as you might imagine, he's still a very important figure for Czech people today, and it's fun to get to know these names that are uh, the, 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 the names that everyone knows in the Czech Republic. We learn them for the first time, and, and it gives us an insight into each of these cultures. Uh, as far as tourist sites go, right there in the uh, Old Town Square, you've got the famous astronomical clock, and this is a very complicated medieval clock that has uh, all these different doors and windows, and at the top of each hour, there's a little show. The doors at the top open up, and the 12 apostles shuffle past, and the devil turns his hourglass and so forth. Um, and I enjoy watching the show, but I kind of prefer to turn around and watch the hordes of people who show up to stare up and, and have their mouths hang open as they watch their little show. Uh, Prague is crowded. Of all the places I'm going to talk about on this talk, uh, Prague is probably the most crowded, the most popular. Uh, I would say the first bit of advice is expect crowds. 
The second bit of advice is do your best to avoid crowds. There's some specific tips in our guidebook, for example, about which parts of town you want to be in at certain times and which parts you don't want to be in at certain times because uh, the crowds follow some pretty uh, predictable patterns here. And anytime there's crowds, there's always a lot of people trying to catch the tourist dollar. Um, and that can range from legitimate entrepreneurs like Hansa. Hansa is a local tour guide you can hire, and, and he's a great investment. You'll have a great day with him. Um, all the way down to petty crooks and pickpockets and con artists. Um, in general, I think uh, there's not a huge risk of uh, pickpocketing and scams in, in Eastern Europe compared to a lot of parts of Europe, but Prague is the place where you're very likely to encounter it. So just keep your wits about you. Uh, if you're going out for dinner, make sure that you check the bill very carefully. Uh, make sure there's nothing on your bill that you didn't buy. When you're paying for something, uh, think about when you're giving them the money how much you want back and then make sure you got that much back when they give you your change back. Uh, they know that, uh, that tourists are mystified by their currency, so they sometimes take advantage of that. And to foil pickpockets, and let me tell you, as a tour guide, I've had people had their pockets picked literally in my presence. Uh, that's how crafty these pickpockets are. Uh, you have to wear a money belt. And if you know Rick Steves at all, I'm sure you're very familiar with this. It's a cloth pouch you wear around your waist, under your clothes, and that's where you keep your passport, your credit cards, um, any large bills, anything that your trip can't go on if you lose it. Uh, I keep a little wallet in my pocket, uh, my front pocket, that I have maybe a day's spending cash. But anything of real value I keep in my money belt. That's kind of my deep storage. Uh, it's really important, especially in Prague, because pickpockets are rampant. And really throughout Eastern Europe, and honestly, no matter where you go in Europe, it's, it's just a good ethic to, to be uh, as a part of your routine. Uh, Prague is a very musical city. Back when it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, there were a lot of famous composers like Mozart who uh, lived and, and composed and performed here. Um, so there's lots of great concerts going on all the time. Um, it's a little hard to choose between them, so I would say go to a box office. There's one right on the main uh, square there, the Old Town Square. There's a little box office where you can find out what's playing tonight and which venue it's in uh, and buy tickets. Uh, otherwise, you'll be approached all the time by... Uh, you know, people in fake Mozart wigs, and they'll just tell you about the concert they're selling. But it's, it's really good to know what all your options are there. Um, and then there's also some great street music uh, like these folks here as well. In general, Prague is a great city after dark. This is one of my favorite little hideaways. Uh, it's a really fancy hotel called the uh, Uprince. Uh, right on Old Town Square, and you can go up and, and pay a little too much for a, a cocktail with a spectacular sunset view over the Old Town Square. Um, other sightseeing options in the old town of Prague, you've got uh, the Jewish quarter, Josefov. Um, back for most of its history, like a lot of Eastern Europe, uh, Prague has a really uh, strong kind of Jewish component to its history. And like in a lot of cities, uh, Jews lived in the least desirable territory. It's the part closest to the bend in the river, which was most easily flooded. Um, now it's been turned into a, a museum. It's a combination of several, five or six different synagogues, and they're all linked together on one ticket. Each of the synagogue buildings has an interesting, very well-described museum. Uh, it's a great place to get a taste uh, of this chapter of, of Czech history. Uh, and some moving memorials uh, also. So for example, in this, this room that we're looking at here, uh, the names of each of the Czech Jewish victims of the Holocaust is written on the wall. And if you're just quiet for a moment in this particular building, you'll hear a voice very quietly reading those names on, a, on an infinite loop uh, as you visit the museum. There's also a very evocative cemetery. Because the Jews were forced to live on such a small plot of land, they had to actually eventually bury people on top of each other, and then they would kind of stack up all of the, the gravestones on the top level. It's very powerful to see that. I alluded to earlier what a great architecture city Prague is. Um, and I would say, again, even if you don't think you're interested in architecture, uh, they call it the golden city of a 100 spires, because there's just so much, such a richness of, of architecture and buildings. And uh, I've had tour members come up to me, and they've got some free time. They say, what should I do with, uh, with this extra hour that I've got? And I say, you know, one of my favorite things is just to walk down any random street and look up, and you'll very much, uh, very, very likely end up running into some gorgeous buildings um, that would be a showpiece building in any other city, but in Prague, they're just com commonplace. Uh, it's really a highlight of the city. Uh, we're going to cross the bridge now of the Vltava River to head over the other two towns of Prague. We've done the new town and the old town. Now we're going to head to the castle town and the lower town or the lesser town. And to get across that river, we're going to take the Charles Bridge. Um, and this is one of the famous landmarks of Prague uh, and one of the most delightful 100-meter strolls that I've had anywhere in Europe. Uh, it's a beautiful bridge that's just jammed day and night with uh, buskers and vendors and tourists and occasionally a few Czech people as well. Um, and it's lined with uh, Czech saints in stone. Each of these comes with a story, and it's, it's always uh, interesting with a lo local guide or something to learn about each of the people embodied on this bridge. Uh, crossing the bridge, again, you've got those two towns right on top of each other, the castle town up above and the lesser town below. 
A as you walk across the bridge, you look down, and, and part of the lesser town is this delightful, tranquil little Kampa Island. It's another example of if you just walk a couple blocks off that main square of Kampa Island, you're going to find some uh, landmarks that you wouldn't know are landmarks unless you have someone to explain it to you. Let's say you're walking across uh, the bridge and you see this wall, and you say, oh, what a shame, all the graffiti on that wall. That's just gross. That's just uh, really tacky. Well, if you're with Katka, who's another one of our tour guides, uh, and we also recommend her in our guidebook, uh, if you're with Katka, she'll say, now, hold on a minute. This is the Lenin Wall, not the Vladimir Lenin Wall, but the John Lenin Wall. Uh, back in communism, uh, listening to Western music like the Beatles was really a sign of defiance. It was a sign of uprising against the government. Young people loved the Beatles. So at a certain point, the young people of Prague started painting murals of John Lennon on this wall every night under cover of darkness. And then the next day, the authorities would come through and they would whitewash over the wall. And then the night after that, the students would come back and paint more of the John Lennon graffiti and so forth and so on. And it became a very important symbol of freedom uh, during the time of communism. There's all sorts of fascinating history, not just at the big sites like Prague Castle, but tucked around little unassuming corners, and you really have to have a good guidebook or a good tour guide to make sure you understand them. We're going to head up to Prague Castle, which is by some measures the largest castle on earth. And you know what? I'm going to say this about Prague. I'll say it also about Budapest and Krakow. Uh, these castle complexes are huge. You could spend a day or two days seeing all the sites, but honestly, a lot of those sites are lost on somebody who doesn't have a pretty strong background in, in the local history. So I think it's a better uh, approach to just kind of uh, highlight one or two things and, and see this area in two or three hours. Uh, it's very crowded. It's very congested. See what you want to see and then go off to some other parts of the city that might even be more interesting. As I said, it's just jam-packed. I mentioned crowd-beating tips uh, a little bit earlier. Um, it's funny, uh, on my Eastern Europe tour, I would always get my tour members up very early on the day we went up to Prague Castle. Most days, we get a, you know, we, we'd meet in the lobby at 8.30 or 9. In Prague Castle day, I'd always say, let's meet at, at uh, <coughs> 8.15. And they'd say, 8.15? And I'd say, just trust me on this one. I knew that if you got up at 8.15 and went straight up to the castle, you'd be at the front door of the great cathedral, uh, St. Vitus Cathedral. Right when the door opened, you'd be the first group in. And you have the place to yourself for 10 or 15 minutes. And then as you're leaving, you see, coming in through the door you just came in through, uh, now it's when all of the big multinational tour groups are coming in and the place just becomes clogged. So coming 15, 20 minutes earlier sometimes can make the difference between a great experience and a really crowded one. Um, so some of the sites up at Prague Castle, there's a royal palace uh, where you can go and, and learn a little bit about this Czech history. Uh, that's, this here is St. Vitus Cathedral, which is that main church that I was telling you about. It's the main church, really, of, of the entire country uh, of the Czech people. Uh, so it's where a lot of their kings and, and heroes are buried. It's also got some beautiful decorations. This is a, a spectacular stained glass window by a local artist. His name is Alphonse Mucha. Um, and like I enjoy introducing people to Jan Hus, another thing I really enjoy is introducing people to artists that they've never heard of. Um, because uh, Alphonse Mucha had the bad luck to be born in Prague instead of Paris, he's not really very well known outside of his home region. Uh, but he's every bit as talented as a lot of the other Art Nouveau uh, artists that are much more famous than he is. He's got this great stained glass window up at Prague Castle. In the new town, he's got a fascinating museum dedicated just to his works. You can see he had this very slinky Art Nouveau style. He did a lot of theater posters and that sort of thing. And uh, the very exciting news in Prague in the last few years, for the first time since it was painted, uh, on display in Prague now is the Slav Epic. This is a huge series of 16 gigantic canvases uh, by Alphonse Mucha that basically tell the entire story of the Slavic people. Uh, and this is really a must-see. If you're an art lover especially, and even if you're not, this is something special. It's uniquely Czech. It's worth going out of your way for. The Slav Epic by Alphonse Mucha. I want to talk a little bit about food, not just in the Czech Republic, but throughout Eastern Europe. Um, I would say Eastern European food has, has kind of a rough reputation. People think it's uh, very starchy, uh, heavy, a lot of pork and uh, potatoes, um, sauerkraut, which is all pretty much true. Um, but it's actually a lot better than it gets credit for, and you'd be surprised how much variation there is from country to country. I'll try to highlight a little bit of that as we go. I think Eastern European food is delicious, uh, and again, there's more variety than you'd expect. Czech food is probably the heaviest, least imaginative of the countries that I'll be talking about. Um, but you know what? It's filling, it's very affordable, and it's often served in really delightful environment, like this, uh, this lively, colorful restaurant. 
If the food is not necessarily exceptional in Czech, the thing that is exceptional is the beer. Uh, along with Belgium, uh, Czech beer is uh, probably the best respected anywhere in Europe. Um, and it's also some of the cheapest. If you go to Belgium and get a, a nice bottle of beer, it could be six or seven bucks. If you go to a, a little neighborhood pub in Prague, it might be a dollar. Uh, it's much, much more affordable. Um, and there's lots of different brands to try. I won't get into all the details here, but, but there's just sort of a whole universe of, of extremely high quality beers available in the Czech Republic. Uh, we're going to head out of Prague now. We've had a, a kind of a blitz tour of that city, and we're going to get into the countryside. There's lots of small towns that are worth considering uh, for a visit um, out in the Czech countryside, but if you had to pick one, I think it would be this one. This is called Český Krumlov. Český Krumlov. By the way, in, in a lot of these languages, you have these little characters above and below the letters. For example, the C with a little hat over it makes it like a CH, Český, Český Krumlov. Český means Czech, like the country. Krumlov means bend in the river, so this is Czech bend in the river, and sure enough, uh, it's got a beautiful, colorful castle complex that's lassoed by an almost 180 degree bend in the river down below. Uh, that river is very popular for canoers. You can actually tour that castle, uh, go up in that colorful tower. They've got a Baroque theater where they still have the equipment to make special effects the way they did 200 years ago uh, for theater productions. You can do a tour of that as well. What I really like about Chesky Krumlov is that it's beautiful. It's not that far from Prague. It's about three hours south towards Austria. And most importantly, it's relatively uncrowded. Um, I wouldn't say it's completely off the beaten path, but it's certainly less crowded than Prague. And once you get out of the big city and into the countryside, you'll find you'll have these floodlit cobbles all to yourself. Uh, there's, again, much more to say, uh, see in the Czech Republic, but I'll mention one more place. This is the eastern half of the country. Czech Republic is actually two regions. There's Bohemia, which is the western part. That's where Prague is. And there's Moravia, which is the more kind of romantic, traditional, old-fashioned eastern half of the country. Um, this is a place to go and relax, do some hiking, some skiing. Um, you've got beautiful little villages. It's also a great place to connect with authentic bits of local culture, uh, like this folk singing show. We're going to cross our first border now. We're going to head down into Poland. That means we have to go to an ATM. Uh, that's right. They, uh, most of these countries that I'm describing today uh, are still on their traditional currencies. This is confusing to some people. All of these countries, Czech Republic, Poland, and Hungary, are part of the European Union. But just because you're in the EU doesn't mean you use the euro currency. It's a separate, a separate animal. So each of these still has its different currency. And as I mentioned earlier in Prague, um, these are very different currencies. They have completely different exchange rates. There's the Czech koruna, the Hungarian forint, uh, the Polish złoty, and then the, the exchange rates are totally different. And it's really worth it when you cross the border to think carefully and train yourself to think in the new currency. Figure out a formula that works for you to remember how to make quick conversions of those prices. Uh, but ATMs, of course, are available everywhere just like they are here or in Western Europe, and they're the best way to, to get out currency. Uh, I'll just talk quickly about transportation options. Um, I find people going to this region are probably either focusing on one city, they're just going to Prague or just going to Budapest, or they're going to be lacing together a lot of these big cities that are pretty far apart. And for that reason, I find uh, trains are probably the best way to go. Um, the communists left uh, Eastern Europe with a, a great network of public transportation, but it's pretty long in the tooth, so it'll get you where you're going. There's always a way to connect two points, but it can be slow. Some of the trains aren't quite up to Western snuff. Um, but it's a good way to, to get where you need to go. In terms of rental car, that's an option I would probably advise against a big multi-country trip with a rental car that focuses on cities, like the places I'm talking about, um, because distances are pretty long, and because once you have a car in a city, you have to deal with parking and keeping it safe, and it can be kind of a, an expensive headache in a big city. So I would rather have trains to take me effortlessly between the big cities. And then if you do want a car for the Czech countryside, for example, you could rent one strategically for a couple of days, just to do a quick loop there. And don't overlook uh, budget flights. Uh, I often have to go from Krakow to Budapest or Warsaw to Budapest. That's a pretty lengthy uh, train trip. Usually it's a long night train ride. Um, and now I just always first check if there's any airlines that have good deals there. There's a lot of these low-cost carriers that are available throughout Europe. You've got EasyJet and Ryanair. And then there's some that specialize in Eastern Europe. Uh, and even if the name doesn't quite inspire confidence, like Wizz Air, as pictured here, this is actually a great airline. It's, it's a Hungarian-based, and I've, I've flown Wizz Air several times, and it's actually really nice new planes, great service. Um, so consider that for your long hops on your itinerary. By the way, I mentioned these countries are in the EU. They're not on the Euro, but they do have the Open Borders Agreement called Schengen. So you can drive from Germany to Poland to Slovakia 
to Hungary, to the Czech Republic, to Austria, and you'll never have to stop at a border and show your passport. It's just like Western Europe now. Um, so it's very easy to get around. We're going to move into our next country, and that is Poland. And boy, I could spend this whole time just talking about Poland. This is a fantastic country, a big, giant country. It's about as big as Spain and about as populous as Italy. It's one of Europe's biggest countries. Uh, I only have time for a few highlights, so I'm going to focus on the first place that most people go and should, and that's Krakow down in the south. Um, and then you head up to the middle of the country, Warsaw. That's the capital. And then up on the northern coast, coast is Gdansk. This is this very historic, colorful city. Um, and each of these cities, I think, they're quite different. They're very complementary. Um, and it's a great way to kind of get a taste of, of the country of Poland. We're going to start in Krakow. And if you had to pick one place to go in uh, Poland, I would make it Krakow. Um, this is really the showpiece city of the country. Um, it's the, it used to be actually the capital. Uh, but about 500 years ago, the capital moved north to Warsaw. Uh, but Krakow still remains the university center, it remains the cultural capital, and for Poles, it's, it's the place they're most proud of. Um, and it's a really beautiful place, very compact, very easy to manage and uh, walk around. The old town is ringed by a beautiful park that used to be the city wall and the moat, and it was torn down and turned into a park. You can walk from one end of the old town to the other in 10 or 15 minutes, and almost everything you want to see is in that, in that radius. So you don't have to worry too much about public transportation. Um, there's that delightful park called the Plenty. The centerpiece of uh, Krakow in the Old Town, and I think, for me, it's one of my favorite squares anywhere in Europe, is the main market square. Uh, it's gigantic, it's beautiful, it's the living room of Krakow. It's where everyone is out and about all the time. And it bustles at all hours of the day and night with pigeons and cotton candy vendors and horse carriage rides and folk music bands outdoor cafes. It's just an absolutely delightful place to spend your time. Um, and it's also got important landmarks, of course. There's St. Mary's Church, one of the main churches in this, in this city that has so many churches. I'll talk more about that in a moment. In the very center is the uh, cloth hall. This is the traditional market hall, and it still is kind of the main place to shop for souvenirs, or at least the most convenient place to shop for souvenirs, right in the center of Krakow. Um, Poland is a very inexpensive country, um, so your dollar goes a long way here. You can have a nice drink outside at a genteel cafe overlooking that square for a lot less than you would in, in a similar situation in a, in a French city or an Italian city. Uh, shopping here is also a pretty good value. There's a lot of uh, woodworking, uh, there's some sort of crystal, and then uh, they have a lot of amber, which is uh, found up on the northern coast of Poland as well. Uh, and then after dark, the old town of Krakow in the, in the main market square is just equally enticing then as well. Um, <coughs> I talked about a little bit generally about food. Uh, specifically, I'll talk about Polish food. And one, I think, budget tip, if you're looking to save some money, uh, they still have this tradition in Poland that started in communist times. It's called a milk bar. It's a little bit of a misnomer. It sells not just milk, but all sorts of po Polish specialties. Uh, but it started as a, as a government-subsidized cafeteria. The idea under communism uh, was to give people a chance to have a meal out. Uh, and even though communism is long gone, people are now used to having these cheap cafeterias and I can go into a milk bar in any city in Poland and have a delicious filling meal of traditional Polish dishes for $5. Um, you know, you have to go to the counter and point to what you want and, and bust, your, bust your dishes afterwards. But you can have, I mean, a really filling dinner at a milk bar for $5, uh, just to give you a sense. There's one in Krakow, for example, that specializes in, in uh, potato pancakes. It's one of my favorites. Uh, and Polish food, I would say, is actually quite different from Czech food. You have some of the same staples, pork and potatoes and cabbage, um, but there's more of a northern uh, feel to the ingredients here. You have a lot of uh, berries, dill, uh, potatoes, um, beets. So this is borscht, the, uh, the delicious savory beet, stew, or beet soup that you get all over Poland. Uh, Polish food is similar to what you might think of as Russian food or even Jewish food um, because it's got a similar climate to that, to that territory. Uh, now, Poland does have some good beer and some good wine, but what they're really proud of is their vodka. Uh, and this is one of the most famous brands of vodka. It's called Zubrowka, which means uh, bison. There are actually bison preserves in northern Poland. Uh, and the story goes that every bottle of Zubrowka has a blade of grass in it. And the grass comes from the bison preserves. The story goes that the bison season the grass, and then the grass seasons the vodka. This is pretty high test stuff, so there's no danger of illness. But it's one of those great little cultural tidbits. And my Polish friends always like to remind me, the good thing about drinking vodka, you do it all in one go, because then it only hurts once. That's the Polish secret to downing vodka. Down at the southern tip of Krakow, you've got the Wawel. Uh, Wawel is the name of the hill where the castle and main cathedral of Poland are. 
I'd say similar advice here to Prague. It's a big castle complex. There's lots of different museums. Most of them are more or less lost on people who don't have a strong basis in Polish history and culture. Uh, but it does have one of the finest churches in this city that's just completely loaded with churches. That's Wawel Cathedral. It's the main church. It's the Westminster Abbey of Poland. And that is really saying something. Uh, I think, from my, my opinion, Poland is the most, uh, I think it's the most, uh, um, the most, I say, practicing Catholic country in Europe. There's a lot of Catholic countries in Europe, but when you go in churches in Poland, you really notice it's, they're just jammed with worshipers um, all the time, and this is the finest of them all. Uh, Wawel was also, in addition to having all the tombs and of the great kings and military heroes of Poland, uh, it was also the home church of Karo Wojtyła. Uh, you know him better as Pope John Paul II, uh, who was uh, elevated to the papacy in the 1970s in the darkest days of communism and provided a great inspiration to the Polish people and really Slavic people all over Eastern Europe. Um, it was uh, really a turning point in communism and, and a signal that, that the, the ways were about to change. Uh, and if, as you might imagine, uh, Pope John Paul II is still very much revered uh, in, in Poland as well. Uh, this is a salt version of Pope John Paul II. Sounds kind of strange, uh, but this is one of the more popular side trips from Krakow. There's a salt mine uh, just on the outskirts of downtown called Wielicka Salt Mine. Um, and it's actually where the miners, over the course of many centuries, started carving sculptures out of the salt that they were mining. They even carved an entire underground chapel. Everything you see here is carved out of the salt, including these relief panels of the Last Supper. Um, really amazing. Um, back closer to downtown Krakow, this is just a 15-minute walk from the main square, is a neighborhood called Kazimierz. Like uh, Czech Republic, Poland has a very strong Jewish component to its history, uh, and particularly Krakow. Uh, I, something like 28% uh, of the people who lived in Krakow were Jewish right up until World War II. Um, and now you can go and see some synagogues that have been turned into museums, some cemeteries, and you can learn a little bit about the real Oskar Schindler, uh, made famous, of course, by Schindler's List. Oskar Schindler was a, a German industrialist who, when Poland was under German occupation, came and opened a factory here. And I'm sure you know the story. Um, he managed to uh, spend as much of his money as possible to save as many of his Jewish workers from the Holocaust as he could. Um, and this is where this actually happened. It's also where the movie was filmed. Um, for a while under communism, this neighborhood was kind of decrepit and derelict, and they didn't really care much to promote that history. But now it's really been rejuvenated and is becoming a major attraction for people interested in Jewish history and Jewish culture. Uh, you can go to synagogues, museums, uh, cemeteries. Uh, there were actually cemeteries that were destroyed under Nazi tank treads. Nazis would go into Jewish cemeteries and destroy the headstones, and they've now been pieced back together in these uh, evocative memorials. Um, and it's become also a very popular destination for Jewish or, or Israeli tour groups. Um, and I would say uh, the Jewish sites in Czech Republic and Prague are a little bit more cohesively presented. That's a good place to learn about the history. But here they feel very meaningful because you have that Schindler's List connection. Uh, and in fact, the Schindler's List factory, the factory where the events actually took place and where the movie were filmed, has pretty recently been turned into a, a state-of-the-art museum. So if you want to learn more about that, make sure to visit the Oscar Schindler Factory Museum in Kazimierz, uh, the neighborhood of Krakow. Of course, the most tragic and, and one of the very important chapters of the Jewish story of Poland uh, took place during the Holocaust, during World War II. And just an hour and a half outside of Krakow is one of the most notorious, probably the most notorious Nazi concentration camp called Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, this is actually two different camps, Auschwitz and Birkenau. The first part, Auschwitz, which you see here, started out as just a camp for prisoners, um, military prisoners and political prisoners. Uh, it was a work camp. People were, were sent here to, to be forced to work. These days, this part of the camp, Auschwitz, has been turned into a museum with some really fascinating exhibits that tell you what it was like to live in these camps, um, the terrible conditions that people lived under very powerful exhibits. There's a room that's just a pile of suitcases, and it reminds us that when people first arrived, Jewish victims of the Holocaust, um, they were told, if you write your name on your suitcase, you can reclaim them later. Well, a lot of these folks were sent directly to the gas chambers and never saw their suitcases again. And when the camp was liberated, they just found warehouses full of suitcases. You can see some of these very suitcases here at Auschwitz. Now, the second part of the camp is just a mile and a half away. It's called Birkenau. Uh, and when Hitler and his cronies came up with the final solution, which was genocide, which was basically the massacring of the entire Jewish race, they decided that Auschwitz wasn't big enough. So they built Birkenau, which is basically a factory for the mass production of death. 
Uh, they could hold 100,000 people here at one time. They had four gas chambers and crematoria that were operating literally 24-7. And this is the famous guard tower of uh, Birkenau. And uh, you might remember the scene from Schindler's List, or you might have heard this story, but this is where the Nazi commandant would stand as people got off the train. He would evaluate each person visually for just a second, and then he would point one direction, which meant they were to be sent directly to the gas chamber, or he would point the other direction, which meant that they would be registered as a prisoner and forced to work and live at least a little bit longer in terrible conditions. Uh, it's incredibly powerful to tour these. Uh, all of the barracks were destroyed as the, as the Nazis fled and also were later cannibalized so that people could use the wood for other, other buildings. But they've reconstructed some of the barracks. You can go in and see the, the buildings where people were, were kept. It's an incredibly powerful pilgrimage, I think, for a lot of people. Some people say, why would I go to this terrible place on my vacation? Uh, but I think people who go generally are very glad they did. And it keeps up the message uh, that is so important to the survivors of the Holocaust and the people who run places like Auschwitz. And that message is never again. We want to make sure that this story is documented and told and remembered again and again, because only by that awareness can we prevent this sort of thing from, from taking place in the future. Uh, again, very powerful pilgrimage here in Poland. We're going to head up to the capital now of Poland, Warsaw. And Warsaw has a very complicated story. In fact, um, I have a very good friend from Poland, and when I first visited her in Warsaw, uh, she's born there, she said to me with tears in her eyes, Warsaw is ugly because its history is so beautiful. Um, I might contend that Warsaw is not really an ugly place, especially since then. It's been fixed up. It's a really beautiful city now. But I absolutely agree that its history is beautiful. What she means is the history of Warsaw, like the history of Poland, is the story of big, mighty empires and armies constantly passing back and forth through Poland. Poland's a big, basically flat space between Germany and Russia. Can you imagine, over the course of history, a worse place to be than a big, flat country between Germany and Russia? Uh, sure enough, the country's been devastated again and again and again, and Warsaw's taken the brunt of a lot of that. After World War II, Warsaw was in complete ruins. There was a, a, up, an uprising here, a very valiant, against all odds uprising, um, that Hitler put down, and to punish the people who did that, he systematically destroyed Warsaw, block by block. This is a, a modern digital recreation of what Warsaw looked like at the war's end, uh, until basically nothing was left standing. General Eisenhower toured Warsaw after World War II and is said to have, have remarked it's the most devastated he had seen of any city anywhere in the world uh, in all of his, his travels and experiences. Now, the positive ending to this story is Warsaw has been rebuilt. The communists did a pretty good job with it, but over the last 20, 25 years, it's really come into its own. It's a really vibrant, energetic place. It's a capital, a, a center of business. It's a center of politics. It's got a really kind of a thriving, um, uh, exciting kind of metabolism these days. And to recreate Warsaw from the rubble, they actually went back to their archives and used old paintings. So as you walk through the streets of Warsaw, you'll see a painting on a pedestal across the street from the building that they used that painting in order to know what it looked like so they could recreate it perfectly. This is the old town of Warsaw, which was rubble after the war. And as you can see now, it's looking quite pristine. Uh, that big pink building on the right side is the National Palace. You can tour the palace and learn a little bit about Polish history there. And the centerpiece of the old town is a very uh, popular statue of a mermaid. A mermaid is a symbol of Warsaw, um, very strong, very defiant. She's holding a sword in one hand. Uh, Varsovians and Poles in general, they want to be welcoming to outsiders who come in peace, but there's a real pride about uh, uh, preserving Polish culture and Polish heritage uh, in spite of all odds. Uh, the other interesting thing about Warsaw is the birthplace of the composer Friedrich Chopin. Now you might think Chopin is a French composer, isn't he? Not, not, not quite. Uh, his father was French, but his mother was Polish, and he was born in Warsaw and grew up in Warsaw. Uh, he f it was during a very kind of difficult political time, so he fled and lived in exile in France, and that's where he became famous as a composer. Uh, but in Chopin's mind, his Polish heritage was very important to him. Uh, he, he would often say, to me, my music sounds like the wind blowing through the leaves of the willow trees in my native land of Poland. Uh, and that's that kind of poetry of everyday life that the Poles really gravitate to. There's a lot of pride in this country. And uh, the last place I'll talk about in Poland, and you know, honestly, for me, it's one of the most underrated places, I think, in Eastern Europe, and that is Gdansk. This is a wonderful, vibrant, colorful city on the northern Baltic sea coast of Poland. Um, you might know Gdansk by its German name, Danzig, and you might think this is the place that I saw in the news in the 1980s when there were all these protests, and it sure looked like an ugly... Uh, kind of industrial city, a lot of shipyards, a lot of smog. 
Well, I'm here to tell you there is a part of the city that did look that way. Even that's being fixed up. But the central core of Gdansk is an absolutely breathtaking, beautiful place, vibrant, one of the most enjoyable uh, people areas, bustling people areas that I've seen anywhere in Poland, uh, really anywhere in Europe. Lots of great landmarks. Uh, again, like a lot of cities in Poland, this was destroyed in the war, uh, World War II, but it's been since rebuilt. Uh, and just a delightful town to go and explore and, and learn a little bit about the history. It's on the northern coast. So it was part of that Hanseatic League, which was the medieval trading league of northern European cities. So it has a feeling that's similar to Amsterdam or, uh, <coughs> or maybe um, Bergen in Norway, um, these kinds of northern European cities. It has that kind of architecture and spirit. Um, and right there, still in the middle of town, is the historic canal uh, where all the ships would come in and unload their goods. I mentioned those protests in the 1980s, and just about a 20-minute walk from the main part of, of central Gdansk, where all the beautiful buildings are, you can actually go to that uh, shipyard where those strikes took place. In August of 1980, there was a strike of the shipyard workers against the communist regime. Lech Wałęsa, by the way, Poles pronounce it Wałęsa. We, we say Walesa, but in Polish it's Wałęsa. Lech Wałęsa had been fired as a dissident. He was a shipyard electrician. When he heard that there was a protest going on, he literally went to the shipyard and jumped over the fence to become the leader of the protest. Um, and all of these shipyard workers huddled behind this fence uh, for about two weeks, uh, and they were terrified because 10 years before, a similar protest had been that met with terrible violence. They had basically been gunned down um, from snipers, and, and many people were killed. So these folks were absolutely terrified of what might happen, but they stuck to their guns and actually had some success. It resulted in some concessions by the communist government. Uh, 1980, so when you think about the Berlin Wall fall in 1989, uh, this was the first cracks beginning to appear right here in Gdansk. And you can go to the actual shipyard. There's a fantastic state-of-the-art museum that explains the whole story, see real artifacts. Um, and you can stand at that fence and imagine what it would be like to be one of the people terrified behind the fence, or to be one of their family members who came to the other side of the fence. The only way that they could talk was through this fence, uh, which was under tight patrol by, by communist soldiers. Very, very powerful sight. We're going to head into Hungary next. That's the Hungarian uh, parliament. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about the different ways you might travel to Eastern Europe. Um, basically, you have two choices. You can take a tour, or you can be your own guide, do your own thing. As I mentioned, I'm a tour guide for our, our Eastern Europe tour. Uh, I'll tell you about the itinerary in a minute. But I did want to say one thing I love about our Eastern Europe tour in particular. In my experience, we get a lot of people on that tour who are very well traveled. They're very intelligent. They're very inquisitive. They've been to Germany, or France, or Italy on their own. But they tell me the first day, I just wanted a little extra help because this part of Europe feels a little more mysterious. I feel like there's this complicated recent history that I want to understand. Um, so I just feel like I love all of our tour members, but the caliber of our tour members on the Eastern Europe tour is really something special. And as a tour guide, I, I really appreciate that. Uh, but they're not all a bunch of serious historians. It's also a really a fun-loving group. And it can be a really nice way to, to meet and, uh, and enjoy other people's company as you're learning about these, these countries that are, that are so mysterious when we start, but so familiar when we, when we finish. Um, and of course, I, you, I'm sure you know all of the Rick, Steele's, uh, Rick Steve's uh, uh, tour spiel. We've got very small groups, usually 25, 26, 28 people. Um, one thing that I really live by as a tour guide and I'm really proud of, we want our tour members to become temporary Europeans. Uh, we're not there to, to show them the big sites and then cart them off to a hotel out on the edge of town. We want them to really understand what it's like to live in these countries. One of the ways we do that is, for example, we take people to a school in a small village in rural Hungary where they can sit and actually talk with the students, and we actually have lunch in the school cafeteria. Um, I think that's the kind of thing that set Rick Steves' tours apart, uh, and it's our dedication to, to really making sure people appreciate and understand these, these cultures. Uh, the, sh the Sort of the, the grand tour of Eastern Europe that we have is a 16-day tour. It starts up in Prague. We head into the Royal Czech Republic, and then we cut into Poland for three nights there in Krakow. We zip through Slovakia to Hungary, where we go for a night to Eger and three nights to Budapest, the capital, which I'm about to talk about. And then sort of for dessert, we delve down south and just get a little taste of Croatia and Slovenia. One night at the waterfalls of Plitvica, two nights on the Adriatic, and two nights up in the Slovenian Alps. Um, I've done this tour as a guide many times, and I really enjoy it. It's the best kind of first look, two and a half week first look, um, at the really best parts of this part of Europe. If you don't have that much time, we have some shorter tours. There's a seven day Prague and Budapest tour that just combines those two great cities. And then if you want to kind of skirt around the western edge of Eastern Europe, we've got a tour that starts in Berlin, goes down to Prague, go through Chesky Krumlov, that beautiful Czech town I showed you, and ends up in Vienna. If you want to kind of hit those big Habsburg, kind of Germanic Habsburg cities there, just outside of what I call 
Eastern Europe. If you do want to go on your own, of course, you want to equip yourself with good information. This is the book that I wrote uh, with Rick and that I update routinely with Rick, uh, the Rick Steves Eastern Europe book. And all of the things I'm talking about in this class, obviously, you'll get all the details in this book. Um, tips for beating lines, the best accommodations, best restaurants, and so forth. Um, it's part of a series of multiple books. And if you're doing a more targeted trip, be aware we've got the Eastern Europe book, which is kind of the best of. But you've also got a book that's just Prague and the Czech Republic. That's authored by our Czech friend Hansa. Um, I've written a book with Rick just on Budapest. Uh, I also have a book on Croatia and Slovenia. Um, so make sure that when you're looking at which book you want, uh, that you get the one that covers the places you need and, and maybe doesn't, you don't have to cover everything. Maybe there's, there's a, if you're just going to Prague and Budapest, maybe pick up the Prague book and the Budapest book rather than the Eastern Europe book. Uh, of course, there's more information about all of these things, tours and guidebooks, on our website. Uh, and by the way, all of our TV shows, uh, Rick's 100 episodes of television, are all uh, in fairly recent development. They're all available to stream for free in their full entirety. Uh, you don't pay a dime. You just go on the website, click on the TV tab, and you can watch a show on Prague. You can watch a show on Krakow and Warsaw. You can watch a show on Budapest. The full-length episode available free streaming online as well as a bunch of other great travel information, articles, um, pictures, everything you can imagine. We're going to head now into the last of the three countries I'm covering, Hungary. Uh, I have a real soft spot for Hungary. As you can tell, I have a soft spot for all of these places. But there's just something really lovable about Hungary. It's kind of offbeat. It's kind of quirky. Things are a little different there. You'd be surprised how different Hungary feels from Poland uh, or from Czech Republic. For one thing, it's got a warmer climate. It's south of the Carpathian Mountains. But part of the reason is these guys. These are the Magyars, or as they're called in their native tongue, the Magyars. Uh, the Magyars are actually a tribe of Central Asian nomadic herders who about 1,000 years ago, 1,100 years ago, worked their way from the steppes of what would today be Central Asia, like around Mongolia, worked their way all the way across Asia and Europe, and decided just to stay in Hungary. Uh, and to this day, the descendants, their descendants are today's modern-day Hungarians. Uh, in fact, the Hungarian language is an Asian language. It's not related to any other European language. Uh, German is more closely related to English and Spanish and Turkish and even Sanskrit than it is to Hungarian. That's how different it is. Uh, Hungarian also is a little related to Finnish and uh, Estonian. Those folks have a similar uh, origin. Uh, let me just give you an example. Uh, um, if you go to the Czech Republic and want to say hello, uh, you would say dobri den. Dobri means good, den means day. Dobri den. In Czech Republic, that's dobri den. In Poland, you would say dzien dobri, good day. You kind of reverse it, day good. Dobri den, den dobri. If you go to uh, Croatia and Slovenia, you say dobardan. Very similar, right? Dobardan, good day. Dobri den, den dobri, dobardan. In Hungary, they say jo napot kivanok. I wish you a good day. Uh, it has a very strange cadence. It sounds very foreign, and that's because of these folks. So remember, anything that you see and do in Hungary, there's this overlay of a very different culture. Now, over the centuries, they've integrated completely with their neighbors. It's a fully European culture, um, but there's this little spark that's something different, and that's something I find really exciting. Uh, we're going to focus mostly on Budapest, the great Magyar capital on the banks of the Danube. Uh, Budapest started as two cities, well, three cities, actually, Budapest and Obuda, Old Buda. Uh, and then around the late uh, 19th century, they merged together to form one giant metropolis, Budapest. Two and a half million people live there now. About one in every four Hungarians lives in or near Budapest. It's a wonderful city. It's probably my favorite big city uh, in Eastern Europe. I always say, my favorite big city anywhere in Europe, it's a tie between Budapest and London. That's how much I love this place. Uh, it's a fascinating, big, sprawling metropolis, but there's so much interesting stuff to see and do. You can see here from this picture, you've got the hilly part of Buda, which is on one side of the Danube. That's for the historic quarter. It's the more traditional quarter. Uh, it's where the castle is. And then you've got flat, urban, modern Pest on the other side of the Danube, Budapest. And I still think of them as two different cities when I'm traveling. We're going to first go to Buda, which is on the kind of historic side. This is the area where you have the castle, uh, the royal palace, uh, churches. Same advice here as I have for Prague and Krakow. If you love Hungarian history, you could spend days at the castle. But if this is kind of new to you, I would be very selective. I'd check out two or three sites, spend maybe two or three hours, there's a lot more interesting stuff on the Pest side, so don't feel 
obligated to spend a ton of time up at the castle. One thing you should see is this beautiful church, the Messiah, Matthias Church, uh, named for a great Renaissance king. Uh, this was built in the late 19th century um, in a way to kind of showcase the historical styles of Hungary, and the inside is just slathered with beautiful golden illustrations of Hungarian history. And then right out front is a statue of Istvan. This was the king who in the year 1000 first Christianized those nomadic Magyars uh, when he adopted Christianity. Uh, that was a real turning point in Hungarian history. Behind him is this really interesting uh, kind of a viewpoint terrace called the Fisherman's Bastion. And these little pointy things evoke the tents of the nomadic Magyars. Uh, so there's a lot of symbolism here. Now, most of what I just showed you was built in the same year, 1896, by the way. And that's a year you're going to hear again and again. Uh, that's because it was the 1,000th anniversary of when those Magyars first arrived. They came in first in 896. And then in 1896, they wanted to throw a big party to celebrate it. So that's where a lot of the big grandiose structures of Budapest came from. Now, the reason they built all those great structures is by 1896, Budapest was the co-capital with Vienna of the huge Austro-Hungarian Empire. This was this gigantic empire that basically encompasses most of what we now think of as Eastern Europe. Uh, it stretched across basically uh, all of these countries I'm talking about, and then about as many more countries further east and further south. Um, so in those thousand years, the Hungarians had gone from being this rough and tumble nomadic tribe to co-ruling this great European empire. Um, that's a point of real pride for the Hungarians. From the castle, you look out across the Danube River, and you see that flat urban side of Pest that I mentioned. And there's the chain bridge. This is one of the great landmarks of Budapest, one of the major bridges. Uh, you might remember in, in the 19, in early 1990s, after communism was kind of coming to an end, General Electric had a very popular ad campaign where they lit up the chain bridge with GE light bulbs. It was kind of this symbolism of, of uh, capitalism coming to Eastern Europe. Uh, and it's still a major landmark of the city. You can cross the chain bridge or any of the many bridges crossing the Danube by foot. Um, but I would say this is a place really unique among all the places I'm describing. This is the place where you really want to get comfortable with public transportation. This is a big city. Um, I describe it as being kind of like Paris. It's not necessarily as grand as Paris. Um, but in terms of its layout, Paris doesn't really have one city center. Paris has lots of distinct neighborhoods and lots of attractions that are spread out over a big area on either side of the river, and Budapest is similar. So you want to get used to the system. It's an excellent system. They've got a really slick subway. Anywhere that the subway doesn't get you, you can take a public bus. Uh, and also be sure to just to enjoy the beautiful, uh, the beautiful skyline of Budapest. Uh, I mentioned it's maybe not quite as grand as Paris, but there are some who might disagree with me on that. After dark, they light up all of these grand buildings that were built around 1896, um, and you can go on a really delightful twilight Danube River cruise, and there's a narration that describes each building as you go by. It's really a fun, fun trip. On the Pest side of the river, there's a very famous street called Vatsi Utsa. Uh, and this is, my advice here is, don't spend a lot of time on Vatsi Utsa. If you've heard of one street in Budapest, it might have been this one. The reason you heard about it is because it was very important 20 or 30 years ago, not because it's worth going to today. Today, it's just an incredibly touristy mall with a lot of shops and overpriced restaurants and rip-off cafes. But the reason why you might have heard of it is in the 1970s and the 1980s, this was the one place in all of Eastern Europe where you could get Western goods. Um, during the end of communism here in Hungary, they had a much more liberal system called goulash, uh, goulash communism. That was kind of the nickname for it. Uh, and the idea was it was a much... Uh, uh, quite a bit relaxed version of communism. You could actually buy, for example, Nike or Adidas tennis shoes. This was the one place in the entire Eastern Bloc where you could do that. The first McDonald's behind the Iron Curtain is right here on Vatsyutsa. You can still go and see it. Um, so there's a certain irony, though, because when people think of Budapest, they, they go to Vatsyutsa because they think that's authentic Hungary, when in fact it's famous for exactly the opposite reason. It was the one place where you could kind of get away from communism in Hungary uh, quite a while ago. So I would say skip Vatsyutsa and focus instead on some of the more outlying areas. Um, wonderful monuments, landmarks, some of the be most beautiful buildings really anywhere in, in Eastern Europe are here in Budapest. This is the Hungarian Parliament building. You can go on a tour, and I really highly recommend touring at least one of these big grand sites. There's a, a parliament, there's an amazing opera house I'll show you in a moment. Um, to get inside some of these, you have to go on a tour, and it's really worth it um, to see sort of when the, the culture here was at its absolute top uh, in that area around 1896. Um, there's lots of great monuments in Budapest. It's got some of the most interesting statues and memorials uh, of any city I've been to. Uh, for example, here's a very poignant memorial just outside the parliament building. 
It's a guy named Imre Nodj. Um, and if you know his name, it's because of 1956. 1956 was the year of a very important uprising against communist rule. If you know Hungarians here in America, uh, Hungarian-American immigrants, they very likely came here on or right after the year 1956. Uh, it was a huge uprising that was very violently put down by the Soviet army that came in. Uh, Imre Naj was brought in, he had actually been a Communist Party leader, uh, and he was kind of brought in as somebody who they thought could become their, their kind of new leader. And he envisioned a system that was a bridge between East and West. He wanted to go with a little more liberal system than they currently had. He wanted to get a little bit away of so from Soviet influence. That's why in this, in this sculpture he's standing on a bridge. He was gonna try to bridge East and West. Um, but as I mentioned, the uprising was put down violently, um, and Imre Naj was given a sham trial and buried disgracefully face down in an unmarked grave, which is a, a grave offense uh, in Hungarian culture. Um, later, his image was rehabilitated. Uh, they actually dug up his grave, found it where he was buried, and gave him a proper burial in the center of Budapest. And that was one of the things in early 1989 that was a sign that communism was thawing because this was a, a huge thing. And now they've got this wonderful mon monument where he's literally standing on this bridge keeping an eye on the parliament building um, from beyond the grave, making sure that the government doesn't try to do these things again. Other great 19, sorry, 1896 landmarks in Budapest, uh, one would be the Great Market Hall. Uh, it's a really enjoyable place to go do some souvenir shopping upstairs or join the locals downstairs shopping for some produce. Uh, Hungarian food is really a delightfully spicy. It's quite different from, um, a very, very different from Hungarian and Polish food. Yeah, they use a little bit of pork and potatoes, but we're south of the Carpathian Mountains. It has almost more of a Mediterranean climate. It's much warmer. That means you get a lot of tomatoes, peppers, um, paprika. It's spicy, flavorful food. There's also a lot of uh, French influence in uh, Hungarian food. Uh, I think it's, for me, it's, it's certainly the best cuisine in Eastern Europe, and I think it rivals some of the best cuisines in, in all of Europe. Um, in the market hall, you can actually go and taste the different kinds of paprika. They actually identify two different types. There's sweet and there's hot. So a uh, chef will cook with sweet paprika to give it that smoky flavor and the color. And then there are shakers of hot red paprika on the table that you can use to adjust it to your own preferences. So in a restaurant table in a traditional Hungarian restaurant, you don't have salt and pepper. You have salt and paprika. One of the most famous Hungarian dishes is goulash, but as I mentioned, everything in Hungary is a little askew. Things are kind of turned on their head here. When you think of goulash, you probably think of a thick, heavy stew, but actually real Hungarian goulash, it came from the term goulash levesh, which is a Hungarian term that means shepherd soup. And it's actually a pretty thin broth uh, that has big chunks of potato and meat and is uh, heavily colored and spiced with paprika, bright red color. Um, so if you go to the Czech Republic or Poland or Germany and order goulash, you'll get a thick stew. But in Hungary, goulash is something quite different. Uh, again, really delicious, nice, spicy food. I like spicy food, and that's hard to come by really in Europe anywhere, not just Eastern Europe. Uh, Europeans don't have a very spicy palate, but Hungarians are one major exception. There's also a really uh, wonderful genteel coffee culture in Budapest. It's, it's got this very upscale feel. They've done a great job since communism of restoring some classic old coffee houses. Uh, and it's just a really cool place to, like in Vienna, to sit and relax with a good cup of coffee and a gorgeous surrounding, read a newspaper. And Hungarian nightlife has a unique feature that's, that's really exciting. It's called a ruin pub. Um, this is a trend that's come about just in the last 10 years. There's a neighborhood right downtown in Budapest, um, where there were a lot of old dilapidated buildings. And basically, squatters would move in, and they would open these ramshackle bars uh, with mismatched furniture. It feels like a building uh, should be condemned, and in some cases, I bet they probably are condemned. Um, but it's a really fun, lively kind of a hipster scene, and uh, from what I've found, I think it's a very accessible scene. Rick, for example, uh, even somebody of his age, he says uh, he feels very comfortable there. It's, it's, I would say it's accessible to people of all ages, young people as well as hip oldsters. Um, so if you consider yourself a, a hip oldster, make sure to check out the uh, ruined pub scene in Budapest. I've actually written a pub crawl uh, to help you find the best of these in my guidebook. In general, Budapest has done an amazing job of cleaning up the city over the last 20, 25 years since communism. This used to be a street that was just choked with cars and traffic and smog, and now it's just a beautiful showpiece walking street. Jewish history here as well in Budapest, like the other places. Uh, this is the great synagogue of Budapest, the second biggest synagogue in the world after one in New York City. The interesting thing about the synagogue in Budapest is it feels more like a church. And the reason is it was built by church architects from Vienna 
built at a time when the uh, Jewish people of Budapest wanted to feel integrated with their non-Jewish neighbors, so they intentionally designed a church that would kind of resemble a church, uh, sorry, a synagogue that would resemble a church. They wanted to kind of fit in a little bit better. So it's a really grand building that doesn't quite feel like a synagogue. It's quite strange. Out behind the synagogue, you've got a very poignant memorial called the Tree of Life. Each individual leaf of this willow tree is etched with the name of one of the Hungarian Jewish people who was killed during the Holocaust. Um, so a lot of powerful sights in this part of town. We're going to head out Andrashi Ut, which is the main boulevard of Budapest. Uh, all the great stately mansions are here. The beautiful opera house that I mentioned earlier is here. Uh, they said that when this was built, the emperor, Franz Josef in Vienna, they asked him for permission, and they said, you can build, uh, he said, you can build an opera house as long as it's not bigger than the one in Vienna. So the Hungarians say, we built one that is twice as grand, even though it's smaller than the one in Vienna. And sure enough, the interior is just breathtaking. You can do an opera here, or you can uh, take a tour. Uh, it's also a very affordable opera compared to Vienna. People from Vienna actually come just a couple hours by train into Budapest uh, when they want to have a, an evening of affordable opera. Great musical heritage here in Hungary. Franz Liszt, for example, uh, is one of these great Hungarian composers. Another site along that Andrashi Ut is a very interesting building. It uh, doesn't look that interesting from the outside, but the history is, is pretty fascinating. It's called the House of Terror. Uh, and it so happens that this one building was used both as the headquarters for the Nazi um, puppet government of Hungary during World War II, and also by the secret police of the communist government after World War II. They call it the double occupation. And now it's a very powerful museum that tells the story of this two-stage kind of out of the frying pan and into the fire situation that Hungary faced in the 20th century. The atrium has a wall of victims, the faces of people who were lost to this building. Um, and you learn all about the history, and you get to see some of the, com the communist era propaganda. Uh, for example, this is a, a beetle that was devastating crops, and they blamed it on the American beetle, America Bogar, from Colorado. The Colorado Bogar is destroying our crops. It's a long story. The crops were being destroyed for reasons that were completely the fault of the Soviets, but of course they wanted to pin the blame on somebody else. And this is a monument to that 1956 uprising I mentioned. Uh, the symbol of that uprising was cutting the Soviet insignia out of the middle of the Hungarian flag, and there's the message, Ruskies go home, Ruski Kaza. Out of the edge of town, at the end of Andrashi Ut, you've got uh, the Millennium Monument, built, of course, in 1896. Great place to learn a little bit about Hungarian history. Beyond that is the delightful city park. It's a great place to lick an ice cream cone, go for a stroll, uh, play a game of chess. Now, these guys are playing their chess here in the park today. Uh, tomorrow, they're going to pack up their chess board and head out to the thermal bath. Um, I saved the best for last. Is if I could pick one thing to recommend for you folks to do in Hungary, it would be to absolutely do one of Hungary's thermal baths. Um, there's something like 25 of them in Budapest alone. Hungary is basically a thin crust over a, a natural reservoir of hot water. Hungarians tell me if you poke a hole in the ground anywhere in Hungary, you'll find a hot geyser. And this is my favorite. This is in the city park of Budapest. It's called Sechenyi Baths. I know what you're thinking. It sounds very intimidating. To answer your first question, yes, if you want to, you can keep your swimsuit on the whole time. Um, it looks a little bit intimidating, and you think, can I really handle this? Honestly, I find the thermal baths basically like my hometown water park, except the water is 100 degrees. I'm surrounded by gorgeous architecture, and everyone around me is a pot-bellied, speedo-clad speedo Hungarian. It's a cultural experience, and it's sightseeing, and it's relaxation all rolled into one. Uh, most of the water is about 100 degrees, like a hot tub. You've got all sorts of whirlpools and jets to massage away stress. I know it seems intimidating, um, but I, I'm telling you, take the plunge, read the instructions in our guidebook, make sure you go to one of these baths, try to join a game of chess here in the water. I find it a great way to unwind after a really busy day of sightseeing here in Budapest. Uh, I mentioned Seicheni baths, that's probably my favorite, but there's two other great baths, uh, one of them uh, in Budapest, one of them's called Gellert baths, this is a bit more of an upscale option, this is a bit more touristy probably, Seicheni is a little bit more local, um, but very genteel and kind of upscale. The other one is Rudosh baths, this is actually integrates part of a 500 year old Turkish bathhouse right in the middle of what's today a modern bath complex really evocative. I mentioned how Budapest is reju rejuvenating and, and fixing up everything. Um, really, all of Eastern Europe is. This is a great example. I took this picture of Seicheni Bass maybe 10 years ago. I went back a few years later, and the same building looked like this. 
all of Eastern Europe, it's like it's getting sort of a technicolor makeover before our very eyes. Uh, every time I go back uh, after a year or two years, it's amazing what's been improved. Uh, I'll mention one more site that you wouldn't want to miss in Hungary, uh, and that is uh, uh, right outside of Budapest. There's a park called Statue Park. Now, you might think, oh, I'm going to go to Eastern Europe and see all these communist memorials. Um, and as I mentioned, that's really old news, and as soon as communism ended in most places, they just tore these down. Some clever entrepreneur in Budapest decided to hoard his and put them in this park that's out on the outskirts of town, and now tourists bus out here to imagine what it would have been like to live under the stern gazes of, for example, Marx and Engels, or the stoic Soviet soldier. Um, this is the one place where you can find this communist stuff in Budapest. You actually have to go out of your way to find it. Um, it's the hard-working uh, Hungarian worker greeting the uh, Soviet soldier. You see a lot of this kind of socialist realist propaganda. Socialist realism was the one sort of authentic, uh, the one permitted form of artwork under communism. Socialist because it uh, echoed socialist ideals. Realism because it showed real people, workers and soldiers and that sort of thing. Uh, Hungarians have a great sense of humor about uh, this dark period, like all Eastern Europeans. For example, this is one of the biggest statues. Uh, it's a Soviet soldier who's running with a Soviet flag. Hungarians have a different interpretation. They say this is a thermal bath attendant running after a customer who forgot his towel. Um, I hope that little local joke gives you a taste of the personality that you're going to find, the endearing and enduring personality of the Eastern Europeans. Um, I wanted to say thank you very much for paying attention, and I really hope you get to visit and enjoy Eastern Europe sometime in the near future. Thanks so much.